Format change. Sam Arano here talking about Israeli politics for the Avocado, and today I'm going to talk about what is now Israel's longest running internal political debate, the role of religion. I'm not looking my best today. In the United States, where religion is seen as kind of a marketplace of ideas where you can pick and choose, it may be difficult to understand who exactly is Jewish. And what you have to understand is that Judaism is as much an ethnic group as a religion, and in fact, most Jews in the world are not religious at all. I personally come from a family of atheists going back a hundred years, but woe be to anyone who says that I or Mark Cohn or Bernie Sanders are not proud to be Jewish. And not only were most of the early Zionists atheists, but they actually saw religion as something that had been imprisoning the Jewish people and keeping them victims while also keeping them together, and that establishing an independent state would liberate them from this prison of orthodoxy. At the time, most religious Jews, for their part, also opposed this creation of a state because they saw it as blasphemous. Man can't create an independent Jewish republic. The Messiah has to become, and become king, and everything will be good again, and this was just playing God. Eventually, there was a religious Zionist movement, but ultimately, it was a minority of Zionists and a minority of religious Jews. In 1949, the War of Independence ended and the first parliamentary elections were held, and as you can see, it was a very convincing victory for the left, with David Ben-Gurion's Mapai coming in first place and Meir Yari's Mapam coming in second. The problem with this, though, was that Mapam supported a right of return for Arabs who had been expelled from what became most of Israel in the early part of the war. If Ben-Gurion had agreed to this, it would have meant that the Jewish state would not have had a Jewish majority. So instead of reaching out to Mapam, he reached all the way over in the other direction to the United Religious Front, as well as some others like the General Zionists and the Democratic List of Nazareth, which was actually an Arab party. Uh, now, in order to form a coalition, the different parties have to agree to support each other's policies. And because the ERF were such a big part of the coalition, they had a ton of leverage to make policy on behalf of religious Jews. The first of the ERF's demands was that Haredim, ultra-Orthodox Jews, would be deferred from military conscription, which was amended into a full exemption in the 2000s, and would receive special welfare benefits in order to continue their study of Torah rather than enter the workforce. And you have to remember at the time that there were only 2,500 Haredim men in all of Israel at that time. Ultra-Orthodox Judaism had been nearly driven to extinction by the Holocaust, so allowing the Haredim to continue their tradition was seen as rescuing a piece of intangible heritage. The problem with this is that due to a higher birth rate, the Haredim have since grown to 10% of the total population, but are still mostly exempt from military service and from the workforce, and there's a ton of resentment against them, more so even than against Arabs. The second demand was that Israel maintain the Ottoman system of confessional law. In order to marry or divorce, you have to go through your state-sanctioned religious authority with its own court system. If you're Jewish, this means Orthodox Judaism, since Reform and Conservative Judaism are unrecognized, and performing marriages under them is actually illegal. Once upon a time, this wasn't such a big deal, because your local rabbi was just your local rabbi. But today, the chief rabbinate of Israel has been totally taken over by the Haredim. What was once just a community of faith leaders is now transforming itself into a massive bureaucracy like the Vatican. The issue has become much more visible with the emerging global consensus around gay marriage, which obviously you can't do here because the rabbis, and these rabbis in particular, won't allow it. Cities and countries used to have chief rabbis so the Jewish minority would have representation. So what does it mean for a Jewish majority country to have chief rabbis, except to go mad with power? I mean, look at this! In order for Jews to marry in Israel, both parties must present copies of their parents' marriage certificates. For an immigrant like me, that means both a state certification and a separate religious one. Even then, I may be denied because my father isn't Jewish, or because the rabbi officiated an interfaith wedding, or because he was reform, or just because the rabbinate blacklisted him for criticizing their consolidation of power. It's no wonder that many Israelis choose to elope abroad or not marry at all, which can create all sorts of new legal issues. The official status of the rabbinate was part of a larger agreement called the status quo, which affects everyday life because it mandates that the country at large observe Shabbat. So from every Friday night to Saturday night, there's no public transportation except in Haifa and Nazareth, and businesses have to close. Shabbos Shabbos! Now many cities, especially in the Tel Aviv region, have passed their own bylaws allowing businesses to stay open. But in response, the current government recently passed the supermarkets law, which gives the interior minister unilateral power to override these laws, albeit no actual enforcement power to do this. Shabbos. More fucking Shabbos. Oh fuck, that's it, I'm out of here. Back in 1949, Status quo meant that religious and secular communities wouldn't interfere in each other's internal affairs, but those days are now over. For secular Jews in the opposition, the term for this is kafia datit, religious coercion. 
And you'd think in 2018 we'd be past all this. After all, these rules are wildly unpopular. But they've stayed in place, and in the case of the supermarkets law have expanded, because of ultra-Orthodox political parties, which often play a crucial role in the ability to form coalition governments. Today there are two. United Torah Judaism makes policy on behalf of a self-appointed council of rabbis called the Sages, and it is a non-Zionist party because, again, many ultra-Orthodox Jews do not recognize Israel even as they depend on it to survive. Shas is more populist and militant and less Eurocentric. Notably, the leader of Shas is the interior minister himself, Arye Derry, the mastermind behind the supermarkets law and also a convicted felon owing to a corruption case when he was minister in a previous cabinet. In 2013, the Yesh Atid party was formed on an anti-clerical platform, and while opposition to religious coercion is standard policy among the left and center, Yesh Atid really seized on the issue and campaigns almost exclusively on it. Since the formation of Yesh Atid, there has been some pushback on this religionization. Incremental quotas have been established for Haredi men, although those who answer the call are usually ostracized by their friends and family and often leave the faith altogether. You stop being Jewish! No! We discussed this at the beginning of the video. You know, Israel had to wait 29 years before even getting a prime minister who wasn't an atheist. 3,000 years of beautiful tradition for Moses to Sandy Koufax. You're goddamn right I'm living in the fucking past! Since all of the active religious parties are in the government and most of the anti-clerical parties are in the opposition, the fundamentals of this issue are not going to change very soon. But if anything is driving the public, in opinion on politics in Israel right now, it's this one. This is about how you're able to spend your weekend, whom and by whom you can marry, and even our precious economy. Tune in next week when I talk about that. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe, but the comments are closed and we all know why. For The Avocado, I'm Sam Arano.